Thanks everyone for coming. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And of course, thanks to Chris for investing time in the A-Alert network. It's a privilege for us to have your valuable time. My name's Elizabeth Cooper. I'm from the Queensland Department of Environment and Heritage Protection and I'll be your host today on behalf of Alert. Thanks, Liz. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, to speak to you on this, what I, a topic that's really close to my heart, which is the importance of proving commercial benefit to increase penalties in environmental prosecutions. Um, who's come along? So the bulk of us are EHP staff. Uh, we've got a few others from BCC, um, NRM, uh, Redland City Council as well. So, but the bulk are EHP. Um, about 50 people registered, a few of us here, but we'll send this out, the re recording, as Liz said, to regional staff. I, many, many moons ago, when the world was young and dinosaurs roamed the planet, I worked for the Department of Environment up in Townsville, <coughs> and um, I'm really passionate about um, training for regional staff, because my experience was, as soon as you step outside Brisbane, the training opportunities just decrease exponentially. So, um, we're recording this, we'll send it out. Um, can I also say, recognise from the start that not everyone is a lawyer, and so I really want to pitch this as some valuable information for lawyers, but also particularly valuable information for um, compliance officers and investigation staff generally. So in outline, I'm going to cover, I'm going to start with take home points. Uh, so the things I really focus on, what can you take from this that you can go and apply in your job, you know, when you go back to your desk. So hopefully some useful take home points. I also then want to move on to an introductory topic which is keeping perspective because I'm talking about the importance of commercial benefit for increasing penalties but of course you know we're wise you know we're prosecutors that have balance we it's not just about getting you know the like it's not like a scorecard where we're just going for big numbers uh, it has to be an appropriate penalty in the circumstances of the case so our objectives um, consistency with prosecution policies those sorts of introductory things uh, then I want to move on to two stories. Really love stories. I do taught out at University of Queensland for many years, and I love narratives, love stories. They're a great way to um, think, to learn, to remember important things. So, got a DD prosecution, um, which obviously dates it um, from a few years ago, where I was the prosecutor. It was a mangrove clearing case, um, and then a recent EHP prosecution um, of an unlicensed quarry. And I want to use those to then discuss. Uh, a few points, um, the, the take home points, but then how to prove commercial benefit, have a quick talk about that, uh, and some downsides as well. So I'll say that the downsides of trying to prove commercial benefit, the main downside is it's harder. It's harder because defendants will fight a lot more. If you go in and you say in, you know, you start discussions, you know, you've charged them, you're going to trial and you get some, you know, calls, you know, trying to sound you out for what penalty you're looking for. Um, if you say, oh, we're you know, going for $1,000, if I was the defence, I'd be saying, God, go for that, you know, it's gonna cost you five grand in my fees just to go to you know, court, another five grand for the solicitors, you know, there's 10 gone just to show up. So a $1,000 penalty, take the plea, it's all done. As soon as you start talking about 50 or 100 or $200,000 penalty, that's when you'll find defendants start you know, lawyering up and putting a lot more effort into defending the case. So that's a downside of pursuing commercial benefit. Um, and then some other lessons. Finish with some questions and like to f finally finish on some discussion about the final, sorry, future alert uh, seminars and what you'd like to see. We, we're trying to, um, with Liz and EHP, we're trying to set up um, bi-monthly um, seminars this year that are practical, useful lunchtime seminars particularly that you know, are useful for environmental regulators. Okay, let's start with the take-in points. And I've given you a little handout, um, which has got four pages. So if you just, it's on, you should be sitting on it um, or have it in your hand. Uh, so I've listed the take-in points on the first and then I've given some of the case law for lawyers. Um, and then at the, on the final page four, there's some of the discussion points that I'll ultimately come to. So you don't have to write anything down, take this away and there's some references. Cool, so the key take-home points, um, first one, 
obvious one from the title of the seminar, but proving commercial benefit is a key factor in obtaining higher penalties for environmental offences as a general rule. Um, that's a pretty obvious point, um, but the three, thinking of three levels of sort of who we are, if we think about compliance officers, uh, so non-lawyers, can I say the key thing that I'd like you to take away is that when you're investigating a potential environmental offence, um, gather evidence for both the elements of the offence, you know, whether the defendant is guilty, whether you can achieve a conviction, but also the factors relevant to sentencing an offender, including commercial benefit. I'm sure you already do that. Um, a lot of investigative officers are off, you know, come from a police background and like you check things like criminal history. So criminal history is a great example because you can't use the criminal history we know to prove the offence but if, say, they plead or you, know, you go to trial and you prove that they're guilty of the offence, that's when you can raise prior offences and that contributes to increasing the penalty. So criminal history is an example of something that's not relevant to proving the offence but is very relevant to sentencing. And commercial benefit is the same category. It could potentially be relevant if the defendant is disputing that they did it. Um, in the last seminar I talked about circumstantial evidence and um, it could be a relevant circumstance but generally if you've got someone, you know, they're caught in the act, they're pleading guilty, identity of the offender isn't an issue, commercial benefit is not going to be relevant to proving the offence. So, but for compliance officers you need to gather both when you're investigating is a key message. Okay, litigation lawyers, um, it's commercial benefit is relevant for both the decision to prosecute and for sentence. And can I also um, give a shout out to managers? So folks, let's just say up to the Director General. Say you've got a big case like the Sibelko prosecution where you know that the defendant's gonna fight your tooth and nail. You're looking at, you know, you're gonna get a silk and a junior and you're looking at three week trial and, um, you know, lots of money for, you know, the investigation and you have to get it approved all the way up to, say, Director General. Um, maybe a non-lawyer, probably is. Um, can I just say to managers that um, what I suggest you need to do is um, support evidence gathering to establish commercial benefit in appropriate cases and developing appropriate principles for sentencing on appeal. So if you lose a case, um, supporting an appeal and the money that goes with it is an important thing that managers need to do. Um, and the sorts of things that sort of evidence gathering you might support is say engaging a <coughs> land valuer. You, know, you might have to get a consultant, a couple of thousand dollars, maybe $10,000 if they're gonna to go to court. So that's an expense which the agency might be unwilling to pay uh, as part of the investigation. But my message would be, look, in an appropriate case, that's a really valuable bit of evidence that can then help you get a really good um, penalty. Okay, let's take in points. Keeping perspective, um, let's start with, okay, our objective isn't just to get the biggest number, the biggest penalty we can get, it's about getting a just outcome in all of the circumstances. Um, we're not overzealous, um, we're not, you know, we're not just gonna overstate our aggravating factors and under, underplay mitigating factors. You know, we're looking for the right outcome. I wanted to say that to start with, it's obvious, but just to emphasise it. We also have to act as prosecutors according to relevant um, policy, policies of our department. Um, so prosecution policies, EHP, enforcement guidelines, obviously the Bible for um, exercise of your discretion to prosecute, what sort of options you're going to look at. Not every offence requires prosecution or involves commercial benefit, that should be obvious too. Um, but a key um, challenge that I think we face as environmental regulators is modern environmental laws often give you multiple options. And like you look at the Environmental Protection Act, you've got EPOs, you've got PINs, you've got you know, environmental audits, you've got all of these things you can do when faced with a set of facts. And how do you exercise your discretion in a sensible, consistent way, particularly when you've got multiple offices spread out across a huge area like Queensland, working in different 
you know, different centres like Townsville, you know, how do you get the same sort of, if an offence is committed in Brisbane, how do you get, or an offence, the same offence is committed in Townsville, how do you get staff making the same consistent decisions? Um, we do that through, obviously, the enforcement guidelines is a key document where we try and do that and staff okay. training and talking. Um, but it's a challenge. Prosecution is merely one option um, and may be used in combination with others. So I really like the enforcement pyramid. Um, this diagram is actually in the 2012 version of the EHP enforcement guidelines. It's been dropped out of the 2014 and 2016 um, guidelines. I think that's a shame. Um, but the enforcement pyramid comes from um, regulatory theory, a lot of work put in by people like um, Ayers and Braithwaite back in 1992 widely used the idea of responsive regulation, that what you do as a regulator depends on a range of factors and you can go up or down in terms of the severity of your response depending on those factors. So the enforcement pyramid, if we start at the bottom, um, we hopefully won't have to do a lot of compliance work because you don't have to enforce because you've got compliance. So the bulk of <coughs> activities out there, you're not taking an enforcement action against because there's compliance. Up from that, um, there might be potential offences, but you've got to have an education and you know, public <coughs> education program, so that's always going to be a part of a good compliance strategy. So education, <coughs> warning notices. Warnings can be inappropriate. Up from that, we've got pins and other administrative actions, so things we can do without going to court. <coughs> Great advantage to us is a lot less work. Um, downside is, in terms of pins, they're relatively small. Um, so up from that, um, we've got other, we've got proceedings that we can take in civil courts for things like restraining orders. Uh, so you might have to race off to the planning environment court to stop a development taking place um, and get a court order. Um, but if we decide we need a fine, then a prosecution is our. Um, option, or own, a large fine that is, beyond what we could get for a pin. So criminal prosecution typically for us in the Magistrates Court. And the three big factors um, in deciding how, where you go on the um, enforcement pyramid is the harm. The higher the harm, the higher up you might start. And you might start at a criminal prosecution. You don't have to start down the bottom with a warning notice. You can start straight off for a serious offence um, with a criminal prosecution. Fault is the other big factor that pushes you up, particularly things like deliberate um, acts done for commercial gain with attempts, attempts to conceal the offence. Those are the sorts of things that should be a red flag saying a prosecution is important in that sort of, in these circumstances. Um, and then remediation effort can push it back down. So the defendant might, you know, say an, um, a spill occurs, significant harm um, results, um, it was negligent, but they have a fantastic cleanup effort. They get in, they work really hard, and they put in place a, you know, they fix it up, spend a lot of money fixing it up, um, and come to you and say, look, we're going to put in, we've recognised this is a problem, we're going to put in place a management system so that this doesn't occur in the future. And, you know, all of these factors might push you back down out of a prosecution, back down to maybe a PIN or a warning letter you can be pushed back down the enforcement pyramid by appropriate remediation. So those three big factors, um, the big ones, um, we've got, say, the BCC prosecution policy. Commercial benefit, profit, isn't expressly referred to in it, but it's relevant to determining the public interest um, in the decision to prosecute in Section 3.8 for anyone from BCC. Looking at the EHP enforcement guidelines, um, in terms of people that obviously familiar with this, but you've got table one, the criteria for determining the impact of the breach. Don't get commercial benefit re referred to there, but if you look at table two, the criteria to be considered in determining culpability, so fault, um, in terms of serious culpability, um, the fifth dot point is motivated by profit or clearly benefits from the non-compliance as opposed to go across to low capability um, the dot point I've circled there did not benefit from the non-compliance. So that's why I say commercial benefit is relevant to your decision to prosecute. And that's got me. I like the enforcement pyramid because I think it's a great way of summarising 
for a lot of staff, the simple decision making, how you integrate um, all of the multiple tools you've got. Um, but anyway, it's been, enforcement current has been left out of the most recent versions of the, enforce, of the PHP guidelines. Anyway. So commercial benefit though is, is there. Um, and it's associated, commercial benefit associated with the defence is relevant to both the decision to prosecute and to sentencing. But you won't see commercial benefit um, mentioned as an element of pretty well any environmental offence. Um, so just as some examples, so we've got the Sustainable Planning Act, um, carrying out accessible development without a permit. You, you know, the two big offences under the SPAR are uh, Section 578 and 580, so breach of a development approval in 580. But if you look at 578, a person must not carry out accessible development unless there is an effective development permit for the development. There's nothing there about commercial benefit. It's not an element of the offence. So you don't need to prove commercial benefit to establish an offence has occurred. Similarly with the development approval 580, contravening it, you just have to contravene it. There's no commercial benefit needs to be obtained. Um, similarly, the new Planning Act, um, the, two, these, the two equivalent sections will be 162 and 163. So carrying out accessible development without a permit. Similarly, no commercial benefit is an element of the offence um, for either of those offences. And Environmental Protection Act, just as a, a third example, 426, um, carrying out uh, an ERA without an environmental authority. Again, commercial benefit is not an element of that offence or contravening a condition of environmental authority. Now, um, I, I put in 430 just as an example. Obviously, there's willful, you know, serious and material environmental harm. Let's not go to every example. But I just wanted to put in 430 to point out, OK, there is the high level um, contravention of a condition is where it's willful which includes intentionally, recklessly, or with gross negligence. So there's a, your fault, a fault element and a, um, but you can still prove it without the willful element because you've got subsection three, um, which removes the willful component from it. But even with um, willful, that doesn't include commercial benefit. So I wanted to emphasize that it's not an element of the offenses but where it becomes relevant is um, if you look at the Penalties and Sentences Act, so you, you go to court, you prove development offence or you prove a breach of 426 of the EP Act. You've proved that. Um, they're guilty. The magistrate finds them guilty. You then turn to what sentence should be imposed. And um, you're then into the Penalties and Sentences Act. And so the Penalties and Sentences Act in Section 9 is the key section. Um, the purposes for which sentences may be imposed on the offender are um, to punish, to rehabilitate, and then C, to deter the offender or other persons from committing the same or similar offence. And it's that um, third paragraph that's the key one for commercial benefit because there's public and individual deterrence that you are seeking to... Um, basically um, apply when you are seeking commercial, you know, a fine based around commercial benefit. You're seeking to deter those offences occurring in the future. So deterrence is the key um, hook into uh, commercial benefit. And I come to when we have a discussion, but my suggestion is uh, any, any lawyers who are going in actually arguing this and doing you know, submissions on sentence, you've got to whack the um, magistrate. We know magistrate Magistrates are very hard working, um, lots of great people in them, but often, you know, they, their normal run of the mill cases are drugs and crime, and, you know, you come in with an environmental offence, particularly where it's a, you know, they don't have a, the relevant approval, but there's no actual environmental harm. It can be difficult to get the magistrate not excited, you don't want a judge who's excited, but, you know, it's hard to move them out of the ho hum, you know, why should I impose a sentence on this that's anything more than nominal? So you need to whack them with. Um, I'd take them straight to the Penalties and Sentences Act, talk about deterrence. So you're whacking them with, these are the key things for you to consider. Deterrence is really important. It's right there in black and white. Um, even if you don't go on to any case law, you're already, you, you know, you're interesting, interesting them with it. And then if you've got some evidence to show the commercial benefit 
and you're starting to, you know, you've got invoices totaling $100,000 or something like that, you're pulling them out of their complacency about it and saying, well, yeah, well, I've got to deter this occurring in the future. And the prosecution's presented all of these invoices. There's obviously a lot of money involved here. I can't impose a $500 fine. It's got to be something bigger. And once you start dragging them out of that, that's when you're looking at a much more significant um, penalty. So in, pe in section nine, you go on to subsection two, um, and these are the relevant considerations. They're within the context, though, of the purposes. So deterrence is the, is the purpose you emphasize. And then um, some of them aren't relevant to environmental offenses, but I've, I've kept them there. They're on your handout, too, of, I think, page two. Um, I've extracted parts of section nine. Um, maximum, minimum penalty, sure. Nature of the offence, but if you don't have a large environmental harm, um, you know, if it's more an administrative offence, they didn't have the relevant approval, then how do you pick up a significant fine? Um, extent of blame, um, damage, injury or loss, um, the offender's character, um, and then G, aggravating and mitigating factors. So, and this is the the key one where you can bring in aggravating factor, the commercial benefit. So deterrence and aggravating factor, that's the two big hooks that you've got straight there in the, in the um, statute to bring in commercial benefit. Not a specific reference though, the commercial benefit in that list, but obvious hooks in. So um, in summary, commercial benefit is an, for an environmental offence is relevant to imposing a, a sentence for both to deter the offence for both the person committing the offence as well as others. And that's what you emphasise mm -hmm. to the um, magistrate. Uh, and then it's an aggravating factor. I'd like to give you two stories just to flesh this out um, and show some practical issues with proving commercial benefit. Okay, I wanted to start though with stories that I left out. Um, so I've got a, one of my passions for the last 15 years has been um, uh, teaching, but um, um, providing case studies of environmental, pro environmental cases, um, because you can get, everyone can get the decisions online, but particularly for, say, litigation, the planning environment court or something like that, everyone's interested, when you're actually in court, people look at the layout plan and the pictures, and that's what everyone's interested in, the judge pours over the layout plan and the like, and you need that to actually understand the decision. But most decisions still don't include the layout plan or key pictures. So my idea was, years ago, um, create case studies where I could put up the layout plans of cases I was involved in and expert reports and help people understand the process of environmental litigation, not just criminal prosecutions, but environmental litigation generally, um, as well as the ultimate decision. So there's a whole series of case studies giving like initi court initiating documents and expert reports and then ultimately a link to the decision. Um, oh, the other thing that always frustrated me as a barrister was you read the decision and you think, gosh, this judge is the smartest person in the world. Look at, you know, it's just so learned, all of these, you know, all of these cases, they must work so hard, judges. And as a barrister, you know, when they've taken basically all of the submissions that have been given to, to the parties, so the lawyers have done all the work, and you get all of these cases that you've cited to the judge so that as a lawyer, you put in a lot of the work, and judges do do a lot of work, but the barristers do a huge amount of work pulling together relevant cases, presenting those to the judges, and then typically a judge will really just look at the cases that have been presented by the lawyers. So um, I was putting up submissions as well. Anyway, stories I left out. Um, you can go and have a look at Crown and Dempsey, which is this really interesting prosecution occurred it's a bit dated now, but it was back in 2001. It went all the way to the Court of Appeal. It was a fellow commercial timber getter who stole some timber from the wet tropics and then did elaborate things to try and hide the offence, in, including digging a hole and burying the logs when realised that um, uh, the um, National Parks officers were onto him. Um, and really good investigative work by um, the investigating officers to get this guy. He pleaded guilty. He charged with a theft under the criminal code because he'd taken the logs from a national park, state land. He was also charged with a breach of the Wet Tropics Act. Um, was sentenced to one year imprisonment for both. And it went to the Court of Appeal. And I've given you some quotes 
um, from, it's a great case for giving you the quotes in the handout, but just a really interesting case. Um, Crown and Boyle, another really interesting case. This guy cleared a big track of Main Range National Park. Um, and there's some, yeah, interesting stuff, but a bit dated now and, and not really, uh, I wanted to, to bring in the non-sexy ones for um, national parks and the like and look at our run of the mill things. I was really thinking about this Pelican Lynx case from Caloundra, which was these developers who went in and preemptively cleared. They had this multi-million dollar um, big development that they planned to do and they went in and cleared to try and clear the site um, and council took really good action. Again, I left that one out. It's a case study there though. Hudson is this interesting case from New South Wales. Started in 2009, went all the way to the High Court and finally came back for sentencing in 2015. And he was, the defendants were fined $318,000. Um, and commercial benefit really features in that. So the New South Wales case law is really interesting. Again, I left that out. Um, wanted to focus on two stories. The first one is a fisheries prosecution. Um, so it involved a case where I acted for DD back in 2010. Um, it involved clearing mangroves up in Maribor. So everyone knows where Maribor is, but let's just focus in. So inland from Fraser Island. And um, can you just see with that image, we've got Fraser Island and then Maribor, and then there's the Mary River that flows through Maribor, and it goes out into the Great Sandy Strait, which is, you know, there's, um, Fraser Island World Heritage, um, Great Sandy Strait, Ramsar Wetlands, so extremely high environmental values, extremely valuable fisheries um, resources. Um, and mangrove protections are basically about fisheries, protecting fisheries resources. So if we focus in on Maribor, you see the Mary River snaking around there. And the clearing occurred um, in that red circle. I'm gonna focus in on that, so just out of town. In this site, and this is the site prior to the clearing, and you can see that stretch of mangroves. This is the site in 2010 after the clearing. If we just focus in on that, you can see this strip that was cleared along um, the banks, um, and then they'd put in basically this revetment. Um, and I'm gonna focus in, if you see down here at the southern, southeastern end, there's these couple of um, sort of pontoons. So they are shown in these pictures. So this is a picture taken by um, Queensland Boating Fisheries Patrol Officer in 2009, and you can see the clearing that's occurred. So what had happened was these, this um, developer had bought it to build a marina with an existing approval. He then went in with um, his offsider. He was a land developer and a bit of a you know, get up and go fellow, decided that he could do it himself. They bought an excavator um, and a pile driver, and the two of them, without any engineering advice, um, went in and they were basically, they were clearing the mangroves with a big excavator, you know, the arm reaching out. And the only reason those mangroves are there on the right was because that's as far as the arm could reach and they were gonna come in and, you know, presumably with a dredge and take out the mangroves. That's why the strips left there, but it was all planned to go. But that's as far as they could reach. And then you see those posts that are in? This is two guys with no background on the banks of this major river. Um, they got part, they, he went out and bought, I don't know, 100 logs from whoever supplies, you know, um, telegraph poles. And the two of them um, drove these poles in um, to the banks. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what ultimately ended. I acted for fisheries, but um, EPA at the time was prosecuting him for, um, it was a coastal development yeah, yeah, offence. And what did he ultimately get? Yeah, he got Yeah. Um, now they've got 30 grand. 30 grand. But the wall's still there. It's just, but this is crazy. These are two guys going in, complete, no engineering, no nothing. Just go in, yeah, let's, let's do it ourselves. So this is looking along it. Um, and then this is, so the next picture's taken sort of standing up in the banks looking back. So you can see those, see that little floating, that's the pontoon. That, sorry, I'll go back. So this little thing floating here in the next image. So you get the idea about what the mangroves were like before. Um, just as a brief chronology, um, there was a development application in 2005 under IPA. Um, it was granted in 2006, um, subject to conditions. Um, the developer purchased it in 2007 for $3 million. 
middle of 2008, he started clearing the mangroves and then in October 2009, a complaint to fisheries led to basically them coming and saying, what the hell are you doing? Um, and the reason they were saying, what the hell are you doing, is because the application had never included clearing mangroves. This is the um, development application lodged in 2005. And if you look at the IDAS checklist, um, in terms of um, fisheries matters, he, he, they said they weren't applying to clear any mangroves, none of the above. And in a response to an information request, it was also um, down here, it's the third, la third last dot point, there's no proposed disturbance to marine plants within or adjacent to the site. And this is the application um, map. The idea was to have floating pontoons where they, the, the floating pontoon would be on the other side of the mangroves. Um, the conditions were imposed. So fisheries wasn't even involved because he wasn't, apply, he wasn't applying to clear any mangroves. So they never got involved. Um, the conditions said you had to comply with the maps. So this is the approved site plan. Um, this guy bought it for three million bucks, but the map he got was on A4. And you, can you read what's in those notes? No, neither could he. But if you actually got the proper version, it was on A3. And the note said, the pontoon will in no way involve the disturbance, removal, or destruction, or damage of any marine plant. So this guy bought, paid three million bucks for the property, didn't involve any planners, engineers, anyone in doing the development, didn't even have a proper copy of the development didn't approval. Didn't have a lease for the seabed. Didn't have a lease for the seabed. There's <laughs> anyway, he was prosecuted by fisheries under the Fisheries Act. Um, they got me involved because he wanted to argue that the development approval gave him the right to clear the mangroves. <coughs> and while they had great um, in-house lawyers, they were um, they didn't normally deal with the IDAS process, so I did the prosecution to deal with the unlawful element because we had to prove that the um, development approval didn't give him the right to clear the mangroves. Um, so that was the offence as looked at before. Um, he participated in a taped interview, very cooperative, saying, I want to do this great development for Maryborough, I'm a great business person, I paid $3 million for the property, you know, it's not my fault, um, or I haven't done anything wrong, rather. Um, he wasn't in asked any questions about commercial benefit during the interview, nor was any evidence included in that, um, in the brief. It was otherwise excellent, a really comprehensive brief. Um, I think the reason why it simply wasn't um, included was because the investigators are looking at the elements of the offence and not thinking about the factors for sentencing. I think that that's the reason. Um, prosecuted. He was prosecuted in the Magistrate Court. He's defending it, saying, I've got a DA. Um, prosecution saying the DA doesn't you know, cover the clearing of mangroves. At trial, he chose to give evidence. So this is the cross-examination. Um, hands over to me. Thank you. And I say, thank you, Your Honour. And so, Mr. Let's leave out his name. Your conviction wasn't recorded. Thank you, Mr. X. You purchased the land for $3.5 million, you said, in your evidence in chief, and the documents are placed before the court. If the development were able to be built in the marina for 140 berths and you wanted to sell it, what would you be hoping in present dollar terms you'd be able to sell it for? And he says, could I give a range? I'm like, sure. I would think 10 to 15 million, 10 to 15. And I'm million dollars? Maybe more. Um, open question, I didn't know what he paid for it. So in terms of cross-examination, I'm just taking a plug there, but he's just saying he bought it for 3 million. So it's got to be something more than 3 million. And anything with the word million in it is going to prick up the um, magistrates um, Ears, but I would have been happy with five. He's saying 10 to 15. So just so the magistrate can hear it again, we go on and say, oh, okay, well, you talked about fully developing the site. If you could do that, build your boat selling shanter, the ship's chandlery, the restaurant and the like, what value would you think, um, what would be the value, do you think, of the property? What would you aim for? And he says, I would think maybe 30 million. So is that the land with the berths? So it, everything. So that then leads into closing submission. So he gets convicted. And this is the extract from the closing submission. So take into account the evidence in this case and the consideration set out above, which is about penalties and sentences act. Um, an appropriate fine is $165,000. This amount is roughly double the application fee. So we had evidence about what he'd avoided paying because he would have had to pay for offsets um, if he, and the application fee if he'd want to if he'd applied to clear the mangroves, and that would have been about $80,000 that he would have had to pay. So we had that evidence, 
but then we also had him admitting that you know, 30 million bucks is what the de development was about. Um, the maximum penalty was $225,000. Um, basically, we're saying 165,000 was an appropriate penalty, um, and then the paragraph 80 um, submitting that less than the $82,000 the application fee would be manifestly inadequate because it would give it a perverse incentive to do the development. So we had that as the bottom rung, but the 165 is basically, yeah, let's test it and see what the magistrate comes back with. So in the sentencing remarks, the court quoted from a New South Wales case I've given you, that we've given him an emphasis. It's a really good, um, really good summary about um, commercial benefits, so the Ray case. From 2009, gets quoted extensively in New South Wales. Um, magistrate considered the evidence that we had about the application um, costs of the $80,000 um, and the application fees and imposed a fine of $172,000. <coughs> I don't know where he got the extra $7,000 from, but more than what we had asked for, plus um, court costs. No conviction was recorded, we didn't seek it, um, and we didn't seek rehabilitation because Didi was actually, would have approved it. The, the more there was the issue was they'd never applied for it, they never had any offsets, and they couldn't now seek offsets because a new application wouldn't have required any mangrove clearing because it had already been done. Um, the pr and the context was Didi was really happy because the previous sort of fines they were getting were two, five thousand dollars $5,000, I think one up to about 10000 but really small stuff, and they hadn't been pushing commercial benefit. So it sort of really pushed their, um, you know, maximum fines way up. So, key lesson from that, um, when investigating a potential environmental offence, gather evidence for both the elements and the factors relevant to sentencing. And can I then just mention this um, case that was just decided a week ago. Um, it's an NRM case, um, uh, Holzenko. Holesko. How do you say it? Holesko. Holesko. Uh, Hill and Holesco, really frustrating um, appeal from a magistrate who had imposed, has imposed a, a, a fine, two, two counts for um, clearing up around, is it Gladstone or Bundaberg? I think it might have been Bundaberg. Two counts. One of them got, um, was for four hectares and got a $7,500 fine. One was for 14 hectares and got a $14,000 fine. But the first one, the uh, on appeal, the, the um, district court judge set aside the decision for the $7,500 and reduced the fine to $4,500. And I challenge you to go and start a bulldozer for less than 5000 bucks and clear anything. Um, like, it's such a small amount of money that is actually being imposed. Um, and in the section on commercial benefit, which quotes from that New South Wales case, Ray, the magistrate recognises that commercial benefit is an issue, but there's no evidence about what that was. So there's nothing there to, to, you know, to give the magistrate um, or give the district court anything to hang their hat on. Um, so oh, I just read this and I was, just found it so frustrating. Um, I read it in the context too of um, EHP gave me this kind of second case study I wanted to mention. EHP. Um, prosecution of a quarry operator in 2016. These are just some pictures of quarries. Um, going to leave out the defendant's name, a conviction wasn't recorded. So, but basic facts were the company was granted approval in 2012 for community infrastructure to repair the Warrego Highway damaged by flooding. Development permit specifically limited to that scope. Um, because it was community infrastructure, they didn't have to go through the full IDAS process and, and get a planning, effectively a approval, um, I presume it would have been impact accessible and I increased costs. It was basically a quick approval for community infrastructure. Specifically, the approval was specifically limited to that. Um, they then operated the quarry, though, to supply other projects, and they were intending to um, go for the, the larger approval, but they never had that when they are actually operating the quarry for the wider purpose. They were issued with four warning letters. Ultimately, they were prosecuted under 426 of the EPA <coughs> for um, carrying out an ERA without relevant authority. Um, they pleaded guilty. The parties settled an agreed statement of facts, which was 10 pages and 13 pages of the EA as an attachment. Um, <coughs> interestingly, 
Uh, and I think that I was really, I'd applaud this. EHP investigators requested documents from customers of the quarry. Seven customers provided invoices showing gross income of a million dollars. <coughs> the defendant, though, um, put on a, a lot of, basically they argued that the actual profit was only about $115,000, and EHP didn't dispute that. But the thing that I really like is that, and I'd applaud, is that EHP is going out looking for commercial benefit for it, because the quarry, just having the, the not having the relevant approval, um, the environmental harm, if they were going to grant an approval for the site anyway, you could argue well, there's very little environmental harm. Um, proving the commercial benefit is a really important factor for then establishing a decent <coughs> fine. The company was fined $70,000 um, in order to pay um, investigation costs of $20,000 and legal costs of $12,000. Maximum fine at the time was nearly a million. Um, defendant had no prior convictions. Um, both um, EHP and counsel represented by, sorry, and the defendant represented by excellent silk, so Saul Holt, fantastic silk, um, rave about Saul, um, and Ralph Devlin, who has worked for EHP in the past, great, um, two excellent criminal lawyers. But you get the idea, um, the defendants arming themselves because they're, you know, if EHP had only been going for $1,000, if I'd been acting for them, I'd have said, plead to this, you know, let's go and get it over with. If they're only looking for a thousand bucks, let's not fight it. Um, I would suggest that their own legal costs are going to be well over $20,000. Uh, I would, or wouldn't expect that Ralph Devlin you'd get for less than $10,000 a day. Um, so, um, yeah. Extract from the sen judge's sentencing remarks. Just, I just want to emphasise here the little blanks are where I've blanked out the defendant's name. But basically, the judge, uh, it was 20 page sentencing remarks, really good, really useful. Um, for EHP staff, I'd highly recommend having a look at it. I think it's a really good model for what you're looking for from magistrates. But basically going into the details about commercial benefit, um, and then referring to section nine of the Penalty and Sentences Act, talking about deterrence, um, won't go into the details, and then coming to the ultimate view that $70,000 was the appropriate penalty. EHP was going for 80,000. Um, and then about costs. So, but the key thing is you're into a ballpark where you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars and it's due to the good investigation by EHP, digging around, finding invoices. Okay, let's just um, discuss a few issues. So um, key lessons um, started with these, so I won't dwell on them. Proving commercial benefits is important. Um, compliance officers um, should be part of your investigation both the elements of the offence and the factors relevant to sentence. And maybe you find there's no commercial benefit. That's fine, but recognise that, you know, when you're providing information then to, um, if, you, you know, if you're looking for um, a decision on, a, you know, whether to prosecute, it's then going to be a factor that, you know, the um, legal staff are looking for to decide what they do with it. Litigation lawyers, obvious, relevant to the decision to prosecute and a sentence and as I said, managers support um, evidence gathering for this. You know, things like engaging a valuer to you know, work out what was the dollar value of the clearing? You know, how did it improve the value of the land? Um, how do you though prove it? Think about this, because when you actually read judgments about commercial benefit, they rarely refer to specific numbers. That EHP prosecution and the sensing remarks have been one of the first cases I've seen where you actually see them looking at evidence. Generally, a lot of the New South Wales cases is just basically a stab in the dark. They look at the scale of the defendant's business. They sort of, you know, <laughs> use the judicial black box and think, big company, big clearing, got to be worth a lot of money. Um, if you're in the federal court with the EPBC Act prosecutions, they're used to business, big businesses, so hundreds of thousands of dollars is, you know, they're used to dealing with that. Um, but the scale of the defendant's business which isn't directly proving commercial benefit from the offence, but it's just sort of the vibe of the, you know, big business should be big fine. Um, ways to prove it, increase in land value, so a values report. Um, Matt um, Pete, who isn't here today, but had a meeting with him earlier in the week, and he mentioned to me that when he was working with NRM doing veg prosecutions back in 2010, they were starting to look for values reports but a lot of the, those prosecutions where they were wanting to do that then got canned when the, as the change of government under the LNP and those, all those prosecutions got finished up. 
Um, so we haven't really seen that, but in an appropriate case, maybe a planning case, um, or you know, say heritage, you know, damaging cultural heritage, something like that. You know, the value for why someone has knocked down the facade of some old building. Um, why did they do it? Um, commercial value could be a really, um, you know, the increase in land value could be the big ticket item. Profits. Um, from sale um, or business generated by the conduct. So the EHP prosecution that I just mentioned, that's a good example of that. Uh, and cost savings avoidance um, as well. So does anyone want to say anything? Those four, cat I've just summarised them. I think they're four general categories that you can think of if you're thinking of trying to sort of process how do we prove commercial benefit. Anyone got any thoughts or of other categories? Or do you think that things fit generally within those four areas if you're thinking about commercial benefit? Gen generally, the four are important. But in your opinion, if someone needs an inquiry into a proper plan for the injection of development, and thereafter, the response is you can't hear, and you go ahead and hear, mm -hmm. do you think that would be sufficient to show to the court that the intent is there to gain in the future? Great question. So if someone makes an inquiry, and they're told no, they can't clear, and then they go ahead and do it, fantastic, yeah. You've got great um, evidence there about you know, what they wanted to do. Uh, that Caloundra case that I didn't talk about, that was an, exactly that case. They went and talked with council. Council said, no, we don't want you to clear that. We're trying to protect that whole area with support and fisheries and all that sort of stuff. We're not wanting development to keep creeping south. They realised that council would never approve it, so they went and cleared it to, and then they, you know, and then it all, you know, it blew up in their faces. But um, yes, you can use that evidence. If you've got a record showing they inquired about it and they were, it was rejected, even if they're not giving you any further evidence, um, yeah, I'd be going and getting a values report saying that this, is, this was clearly their objective. It's not just an accident. And no one goes out and clears, you know, big parcels of land for, you know, by accident. Maybe one tree, maybe a branch, but you know when you're clearing hectares or hundreds of hectares, it's not, you know, it's expensive. Um, so that would be value of land. I would suggest looking at that one. Anyone? Any other categories? Just in relation to the four problems in that prosecution, where there's a cost avoidance, so there might be a tailings dam there required. Yeah, tailings dam. So Queensland Nickel. Yeah. So yeah. If they need to expand under the EA, they don't because they don't want to pay for it. Yeah, so they don't want to. Cost. Yeah. And you, you might get an expert report about that. And again, you might have to invest money in that. But you can be, like Queens and Nickel would be the great one. You're looking, you'd be looking at a hell of a lot of money for their tailings dam, you know, and if they had to raise it, or you know, if they had to, they've got all their seepage problems, haven't they? So, and where you've got a big site, rehabilitation would be another one, where say you're prosecuting someone for, for failing to rehabilitate properly, then the cost avoidance could be a great, hey Matt, um, could be a great reason, you know, that's, that's why they did it. So, you know, put on your thinking caps, think how can we prove this? How can we give substance to the cost avoidance um, issue and, you know, whack the magistrate in the face with this wasn't, you know, just something that didn't cause much harm and it's a shame and the, the defendant's now sorry and I shouldn't give, give them a big fine. You know, if you're looking at their saved hundreds of thousands of dollars by not doing proper rehabilitation, then that should be what you're seeking for the fine. And if you put evidence before a magistrate and they still give you a $500 fine, then you know, that's the sort of thing where I'd be saying, you know, managers should be then supporting looking at appeals for those sorts of issues because it's a, it's a big, big deal. It's a lot of money involved and you will get fined. You know, what your defendants are looking for is the smallest, you know, typically when you're acting for a defendant, you know you're stuffed, it's about um, damage mitigation at that point. You're trying to minimise the damage to your client. And so the smaller fine you can get, great. Um, but, you know, from a prosecution's perspective, you're looking for the right outcome for the law, for justice, you know, and if the magistrate gives you a piddling fine that, and the defendant's laughing all the way to the bank because they've saved $200,000 in rehabilitation costs, Look at, look at those sorts of things and, and I would be suggesting pushing for an appeal and you know, see if you can get support from management for that. As I said, um, to start with, downsides to going for commercial benefit, 
There's more work involved, um, and defendants will fight harder. De you know, typically, if you're acting for a defendant, you get the people that are belligerent. They just hate the environment. You know, hate environmental regulators. It's my bloody land, and those bastards shouldn't be able to come and tell me what I want to do. Rah, 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 all that stuff. Belligerence. Um, protect their reputation. So, Sabelco, big company. They don't want. Um, you know, even though the fine might be small in comparison to their profits, they just don't want the fine because it's bad for their corporate reputation. So they fight, the, well, they're belligerent and they're protecting their reputation. Uh, and then severity of the likely sentence. And as soon as you start talking to them, they come to you about plea bargaining and you say, we're going for a $150,000 fine. That's when, you know, you're expecting them, they're not going to plead to it and it's going to be more work for you. But if that's what you decide is the appropriate fine, then, you know, get in and work for it. Okay, um, other lessons, uh, this is just a couple of points. I put these on the um, handout. For litigation lawyers, if you're representing the department making these submissions you know, in the magistrate's court, I would lock down the Penalties and Sentences Act, talk about deterrence, talk about aggravating factors, whack the magistrate in the face about that. I'd be reluctant, I, I mentioned the Ray case um, from 2009, which is the leading Australian case on commercial benefit in environmental offences, and a fantastic decision. I would happily go there, but um, or at least put it in written submissions, but you, you know, you quickly get the feeling for what the magistrate is interested in, and if they're dismissive of your submissions, you're not gonna dwell on things, so whack them with the Penalties and Sentences Act. You need to give them something that they just can't ignore, and you know, and think that they're going to get away with it on appeal. Um, my thought is also current Queensland case law is still relatively immature. If you look at the cases I've given you on the handout, there isn't a huge amount there. The New South Wales decisions are a lot more advanced. <coughs> what you have got there, though, is a good foundation, and the Penalties and Sentences Act, deterrence, uh, aggravating factors, you're on, I just emphasise that final paragraph, you're on really safe ground arguing for higher penalties when you have evidence of commercial benefit. Put evidence before the court, argue for it, you're not going to get knocked out on principle. No appellate court is going to say commercial benefit is not relevant. If you've put evidence before it, that case I just showed you from that district court case, there just was no evidence um, about commercial benefit and, the, and it gets you know, knocked down, veg clearing, you know, 20 he or the four, four hectares knocked down to, from seven and a half to four and a half thousand dollars and it's just, it's just insignificant. Um, okay, wrapping up. Um, covered keeping perspective, two case studies, <coughs> discussion. I've given you most things on a handout um, and uh, open the floor to any questions and then we'll have a brief discussion before we wrap up. It's 5 2, I notice now, so if anyone needs to go, please don't feel um, rude by getting up and leaving. Um, but does anyone have any questions about, about this generally? Or comments? If you've been involved in any prosecutions, your thoughts? Um, investigating staff. I've got a question, Chris. You've obviously looked at other jurisdictions in your travels and in your um, um, university work. You know, you talk about, yes, it's going to be more work to put case on over to the commerciality and commercial benefits. So I'm aware that in New South Wales, for example, their ability to recover legal costs yep. is much higher than. <laughs> It's frightening. It's kind of active for defendants in New South Wales. It is bloody frightening. The legal costs become crippling. Yeah, anyway. But yeah. So, so uh, and those sort of costs are obviously um, are relevant here too. How, what do we need to do in Queensland to, for example, the New South Wales, um, which is what I'm actually referring to, where they are, their legal costs, um, even without a trial, they might only be 10 to Look, there's no magic bullet for Queensland um, with how we improve, you know, you actually recovering your full costs for, you know, legal costs. Um, that um, quarry case from 2016, you got $12,000 for it. You know, I'm sure that it cost you more to have Saul um, and all the work that went into it. Um, but that's, uh, that's a broader question about, you know, criminal law and, and I'm also conscious about the reasons why, for public policy reasons, we <coughs> fairly limit the recovery of costs in criminal proceedings. Because, yeah, for a whole range of reasons, um, 
from a, it's a public policy reason that we're you know, limiting costs because they can be absolutely crippling for defendants. I've, I had a fellow who, this is just a side story, a fellow up in Rockhampton um, who fought, fought with the council about contempt for a p and &E order. He was found in contempt, sentenced to jail for three months, suspended after one month. That was the order of the court and we took it on appeal to the Court of Appeal. He has ended up with $200,000 in cost. I just think it's outrageous what the council has sought in costs from him. This is a guy whose operation is in the bloody city and they've gone, they've got seeking $200,000 and this guy, a 70 year old pensioner, no, he's got two properties. He's having to, they're, they're now or, you know, bankrupting him and taking one of his properties off him. And it's just, you know, you act for defendants and yeah, I'm from a small town. I, I just saw him as sort of like my uncles and stuff when I was growing up, you know, belligerent old codgers. But, you know, he, he's been to jail. So there was no discretion in court? Well, it was a p and &E court contempt proceedings and, you know, you're then in the sort of is it quasi civil case, but basically costs, the bloody month in jail is not the big thing. 200,000 bucks, he's losing one of his properties. Cost is a big issue for those sorts of cases. And I just, anyway, anyway, I, I see it from both perspectives. In his discretion, the no, cost the cost, cost, the court just bloody awards costs and then you work it out with the registrar, typically. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the court will award costs. And we were, I was arguing that cost should be an element of the penalty that's imposed upon him. Because I was saying, look, he's gonna end up with, at the, $50,000 in costs at this stage when we were at trial. That's what they had said that their costs were. After trial and they were awarded costs, it suddenly grew to 100. Get that. <coughs> um, but anyway, we're, I was saying 50,000 bucks is what he's gonna pay in costs. That should be taken into account in terms of his penalty. Um, and the court refused, and that was one of the grounds that we appealed to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal com completely hated him because the facts were really bad, you know. <laughs> Really got up the court's nose. So anyway, we got, we're stuffed on appeal. But you know, this guy has ended up losing one of his properties. Cost is a big issue. It's an effective penalty that you're getting as a regulator, but you're bringing the full you know, machinery of the state and it's the penalty that really should be the big, anyway. It's a whole, there's a whole public policy So New South Wales there. managed to deal with public policy. Look, New South Wales is frightening going, for, and, and often, as I say, costs are as big or bigger than the actual penalty. Yeah, so, anyway. I think that you know, the penalty, we might get a 20 grand penalty for something, but the defence might have spent 100 grand defence. Yep. So, that, that's their choice. That is their choice. They've spent, and you can then think, and that's why I put for they that Corrie case. Grand getting it down to 25 to 20. Yep, that's exactly right. And you can think of that, because I, I put, I listed that for that quarry matter because you've got a fine of $70,000 plus the $12,000 for legal costs plus the $20,000 for investigation costs. But you can also think in terms of effective penalty to the defendant, there's at least another $20,000 um, in their own legal costs. Uh, and yes, that is their choice. And somehow some that's poor management. I mean, they started penalty trial and that's poor, of course, I you know. completely, I completely agree. But I have also acted for defendants where the, in New South Wales EPA, it was one matter I acted in, and I just thought the EPA was, we looked, there was a waste transporter in bloody northern New South Wales, and really the penalty we we're looking at was 5,000 bucks, and this guy, they were going for $40,000 in costs and investigation costs, and the magistrate took one look at it, it was a plea on the first mention, and the magistrate just <coughs> said, you know, what the hell are you doing? So it was one of those cases where as a lawyer, a defence lawyer, you're there going, thank God for an independent judiciary. And I think there was $5,000 in investigation and legal costs. So they got effectively $10,000 in total, as opposed to $50,000, which is what they were seeking for my guy, who had two children, was out of work, had no money, and 50,000 bucks, was going to, he was going to default on that and go to jail. Um, you know, and they refused to take into any account the, his mitigating circumstances. It was just so unreasonable. Um, so anyway, got, that's know, putting on my defendant's hat. Sometimes. Sorry. We've received the odd correction over the years to costs to the full extent of the law. Yeah, to the full extent of the law. I, I, I but that's, that's you know, I, I. Rightly or wrongly. But it's 
comes in the ASEAN area, there's you know, treasury ties to this, this become certain. So I think there's a general sort of interest to tell them um, some of the interest values of this board, or at least make sure they're cost neutral. It's great public. This point we have another seminar on public policy. Um, I'm <laughs> noticing. Uh, I'm uh, noticing. Uh, uh, yep. Wow. And um, I don't know where, what cost we're thinking Yeah, okay, wow. <laughs> a million dollars in costs. Yeah. But that's going to be, you know, I'm just, obviously you've got a big business and I can see your argument for getting full cost recovery from them. I'm more thinking about the small defendants where they get completely hammered. And yes, there's some, you know, some people who are unbalanced out there who, you know, strong views about their land rights and those sorts of things, you know. Anyway, that could be a great topic. Um, and shall we wrap up questions there and just finish on? Um, I'm noticing it's five past, but um, with Liz, um, perhaps this is something we can. There's a feedback sheet. Um, as I say, our plan is with Alert is to have every two months, so bi monthly, a lunchtime seminar. We can come along, have good professional development, something practical you can take your teeth away to. So we'd love to hear about recent cases, if you've got some practical lessons for other regulators or other topics, maybe costs. Um, it might be, you know, there's been a, you know, some recent, we could do something as basic as looking at the new Planning Act and thinking about the major offences under that and how that's all fitting together. It could be something like that. Um, so any suggestions, perhaps you could fill out or send an email to Liz about it. I know I'm conscious it's five minutes, five past. Does anyone have any, any suggestions for that that you want to raise now? Or are you happy to send it in an email to Liz? Okay, great. Well, shall we wrap up? Thanks, Liz. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. And I hope that's been useful for you. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks, Liz. And yeah, we've got some biscuits and stuff, so please take one on your way out the door. Um, and for our future seminars, please bring along your lunch and sit there and happily munch away. It's a lunchtime seminar for a reason. Cool. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Hey, hey Sorry? <laughs> no, no, you knew what was going to um, be there. Yeah, yeah, I was getting a bit smashed myself. Yep. Um, Let's just stop this recording. Yeah.